Hello everyone, this is the Kevin Zhao. Uh, I'm a professor at MKSU. Uh, let's uh, continue our discussion for this capital asset pricing model and uh, arbitrage pricing theory. Okay, previously we recognized that this CAPM model or capital asset pricing model is the foundation for modern finance theory. And uh, through this model, we recognize that the stock return uh, can only be justified by its market risk, which is captured by the beta. That, that is the only factor that will affect expect return of a stock. And uh, the theory, theory is great, and uh, people love the theory, and they treat the CAPM model as the Bible for their finance practice, especially during 1970s and early 1980s. But later on, people uh, began to uh, complain a lot on this uh, theoretical uh, theoretical model because in this real financial markets, uh, when people collect data and test if this theory works well in this uh, in this real market, they found that uh, there are a lot of problems. First of all, this beta tend to change over time. And uh, more importantly, they found that uh, beta is kind of a weak factor that can explain stock market return and individual security returns as well. Uh, people try to capture other factors such as, let's say, GDP growth, unemployment rate, uh, the change of business circle, interest rate, or even oil price. Those factors actually may be better than beta explaining stock returns. And on the macro level, people look at the debt ratio of a company, the size of the company, the growth potential of the company, and they also found that those uh, firm level factors uh, tend to work better than beta. So it looks like this CAPM model doesn't fit into this financial market in reality. So what is the problem? What is the problem? Well, uh, the theory cannot be test, uh, testified through the observation of the financial markets. Right? So where's the problem? Well, as, I, as we discussed before, this CAPM model is a theory. Right? It's a economic theory based on equilibrium analysis. And uh, at the very beginning of this equilibrium analysis, researchers actually imposed a, th a series of assumptions such as the market is a perfect place there's no taxes there's no limitation on lending and borrowing and the investors are homogeneous in terms of their expectation of expect rate of return and the standard deviation of a given security and the only difference between investors are their risk aversion, risk aversion preferences. But in reality, those assumptions are not valid. Those assumptions are not valid. Uh, it's more often for you to find that, okay, uh, the information available on the market is not equally distributed among all investors, institutional investors. Uh, may have more information than individual investors. And there is information asymmetry exists on the market. And this market, on, on, this, on, on this market, of course, there's taxes, the transaction costs, of course, there's a, uh, lending and borrowing limits. Uh, more importantly, investors are not homogeneous. They have different opinions. That's why they trade securities. Some people believe that uh, uh, Certain security is overpriced, while the others believe it's, uh, it's, it's on a value. That's why they trade a security. So a lot of assumptions imposed in this cap hand model are not valid. That's why uh, when we need to use uh, the financial data to test the theory. It looks that the theory doesn't fit into this financial market. So some people may argue that, okay, if it doesn't fit into this uh, financial market, then we say this uh, theory is useless. Can we say that? Well, you cannot. The theory is still great. 
and uh, we can view this uh, financial market in reality as a huge space huge space that doesn't have boundary and right now in order to examine the nature of this space uh, we actually build a platform called a campaign right in this space uh, a plan for in this space and this plan for is divide uh, is defined by its boundaries and uh, those boundaries are simply assumptions of the model and within the boundary of, or, 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 or within the boundary of this plan form uh, the principle the principles of risk return trade-off of course uh, uh, holds right? and uh, stock return should be a function of its systematic risk but when we need to explain our uh, any situations outside of this plan form, when we need to explore a little bit more beyond this uh, plan form, well, you just cannot uh, utilize this principle to explain everything. But the campaign model actually help us to build up a a a very nice uh, plan form in this uh, huge space called the financial market and that is the beginning point for us to explore more uh, what's going on in the financial market so capem model although it doesn't fit into the empirical analysis but still a great model right? and it uh, builds up the beginning point for us to explore this uh, complicated financial markets so if CAPM model cannot deal with most situations in the financial market, what can we do? Well, during the 1980s, a lot of researchers actually began to work on this issue. And there are many uh, approaches that they took. And a, com a very, very common approach is uh, they, they recognized the limitation of this CAPM model. So in order to explore more uh, beyond, this, uh, beyond this plan for CAPM, they began to uh, re uh, relax, relax those assumptions one by one so they can see more uh, around this plan for in this uh, space called financial market. And other researchers actually uh, began to explore new ways, find new methodologies to see what's going on in this financial markets. Right? I mean, previously, CAPM model built up a platform that uh, has many assumptions. Uh, well, what about we start with a new approach that doesn't need a lot of assumptions? In that case, well, less assumption means we can uh, we can explore more in this uh, financial market space. So now, uh, let's look at um, the new development in terms of financial theory based on this CAPM model. And the limitation of KPM model is that it is a one-factor model. There's only one factor that determines stock return, which is market risk, or the market risk that can be captured by the beta. There's only one factor in the equation. But in reality, but, but in reality uh, people, people found empirically that uh, many factors may work in determining stock return. So one natural extension for KPM model is to put more factors into the equation. Instead of having just a one factor, we can develop two factor model, three factor model, uh, four, five, six, or even uh, n factor models into our empirical research. And here is the example of a two factor model. Right? Now here we have two factors. One is market return. Uh, market premium, right? The expected market return minus risk-free rate that is market premium, and uh, beta capture the market risk. That's the one factor that shapes stock return. But beyond that, we add another factor. Let's say treasury, treasury bond interest rate, treasury bond interest rate, and of course, treasury bond interest rate is higher than risk-free rate, and uh, we can ut utilize. Uh, this treasury bond interest rate as a critical factor that affect stock return. And this is the second factor that we can put into our equation. And uh, here you see beta ITB, that is coefficient on this interest rate factor. So instead of having uh, just one factor, we can, uh, now we have two factors in our analysis. 
And among the multi-factor models, the most famous one is called the Fama French three-factor models. This is the most famous multi-factor models, right, as extension of Capen model uh, in the empirical area. So what is the uh, Fama French three-factor model? Well, this, this model was developed in early 1990s by two very famous financial researchers. Dr. Fama and Dr. French. They both worked for uh, University of Chicago at that time. And uh, both, both doctors won the Nobel Prize for their contribution to the financial literature due to their contribution of the three-factor model. So what Fama French did was that uh, they collected the data on the financial market. I mean, their initial purpose is to test Capen model empirically. So they collect data, about 50 years data on the financial market, and uh, they, they put the data into their empirical model or one-factor model to see how strong uh, the beta is in explaining stock returns. They also consider alternative factors uh, such as debt ratio of the company, the size of the company, the book to market ratio to the company, so on and so forth. And uh, after a series of empirical research, uh, they, they, they have a, uh, I mean, they got, they got a surprising, surprising empirical results. Right? And uh, their results is expressed in their three-factor models. So in the three factor models, they only consider three factors. First one is a beta, right? As you see, this beta uh, as a proxy for the market risk. And also they consider two other factors. The first one is the size of the company, the size of the company. And the other one is book to market ratio, book to market ratio. And uh, those two factors, I mean, based on CAPM model, shouldn't have any impact on the stock return because stock return is a function of its market risk. And then now we add two firm specific factors into our analysis, book to market ratio and the size of the company. And actually, their regression show that this beta is a pretty bad. It's a pretty bad predator. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, the beta has really weak, really weak explaining power for stock returns. Sometimes it worked, let's say during 1970s, but during 1980, it doesn't work at all. And uh, this beta overall has a weak explaining power on stock returns. But surprisingly, they found that two other factors, book to market ratio, as well as firm size, actually have very, very strong explaining power for stock returns. And uh, they cause those two factor. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, they cause those two phenomena as uh, two financial anomalies. One is size anomaly or size effect. The other one is is book to market ratio effect or book to market effect. And those two effects are anomalies uh, based on our understanding of financial market. Uh, based on this CAPM model. This CAPM model says only market risk determines stock return, but uh, we have two anomalies. One anomaly is that uh, small comp uh, the, the, the size, the firm size, have very strong ex explaining power on stock return, as well as this book to market ratio. So their empirical research reveals that uh, over the last 50 years or so, uh, small companies, small companies tend to outperform large companies, given the same level of beta. I mean, based on CAPM model, that doesn't make sense because given the same risk, uh, stock should uh, earn the same return. But here, uh, the empirical data tell us that the small companies tend to outperform large companies, given the same uh, market risk. That's the uh, first surprising result uh, from this Fama French three-factor model. And we call this as uh, size effect. The other effect is uh, book-to-market ratio effect. And uh, they found that uh, value companies, value companies tend to have uh, high book-to-market ratio, and uh, growth companies tend to have low 
book to market ratio. I mean, on the financial market, you often observe that uh, the company that has greater opportunity for growth tend to have high P ratio or, or low book to market ratio. But uh, for the company that lack uh, future growth opportunities, they tend to have a low P ratio and a high book to market ratio. So this book to market ratio represents growth growth opportunities of a company. Right? And uh, growth opportunities shouldn't have anything to do with stock return based on our understanding of cap and model because uh, given the same uh, given the same market risk, uh, company A may have more potential for growth, company B has a lower uh, perspective for future growth, in, in, in that case, they should earn the same return, right? Because they have the same market risk, but uh, empirically, it's not, it's not. And uh, during the last 50 years or so, from a French, show that uh, on this financial market, the value company, the value company, tend to outperform growth company, given the same level of market risk. And this is the second surprising result that we can learn from the three-factor model. And we call this as value company effect. Value company effect. And the implication from from a French three-factor model is that, okay, first of all, this beta is, is not a strong factor that can explain stock return. Instead, we have two other uh, great, great candidates explaining stock return. One is firm size, and the other one is book to market ratio. Right. And here's an example uh, how we can uh, estimate the return for uh, one stock. One stock. And uh, here, uh, Instead of looking at just the uh, beta, uh, we look at two other factors, uh, firm size factor and uh, book to market ratio effect, uh, book to market ratio factor. And uh, this SMB, SMB is representation of uh, firm size factor and this HML is the representation of book to market ratio factor. And uh, here, uh, this table showed you for the company of Google when we run regression and uh, uh, ba based on uh, based on three factors. One is uh, market return. The other one is small company premium. Or, I mean the small company premium and value company premium. Uh, we are generating uh, coefficients on those three factors. And uh, the results show you, you that, okay, here the, uh, uh, the intercept is 0 0.62 with 1.5 beta on the market, on the market premium. And uh, for small firm beta is 0 point, uh, negative 0 0.2 and uh, uh, beta 3, uh, the coefficient uh, book to market ratio is negative 1.33, 1 1.33. And uh, those are coefficients based on three factor regression. So uh, this regression uh, is becoming more and more popular among financial professionals nowadays. Uh, before 1990s, uh, people tend to uh, use just a one-factor model, right? And they use market premium and the one-factor in that regression and uh, use that regression to get a beta estimation. But uh, nowadays, uh, it becomes a new standard for those professionals to run three-factor regression models. Instead of having just a one estimate on beta, they, can, they, they need to uh, introduce two other factors, uh, SMB and HML, or the size factor, book to market factor into their analysis to generate three coefficient estimates. Right. And with those three coefficient estimates, they can utilize uh, data to forecast, to forecast required rate of return for a specific security. So uh, nowadays, uh, it's a new standard for professionals, not using just a one factor model, but this uh, from a French three factor specification uh, to, to, to estimate uh, required rate of return for a company. 
Okay, that uh, that is a multi multi factor models that uh, financial factors uh, financial researchers have worked on during the last twenty years also. And in the early nineteen, I mean during during the middle of nineteen eighties, during the middle middle of nineteen eighties, a lot of financial researchers actually uh, explore a new way, explore a new way, uh, trying to tackle the issue of risk return trade off. And they rec recognize that uh, the, uh, there's a great, there are a lot of limitations associated with CAPM model, mainly because CAPM model is subject to so many unrealistic assumptions. And uh, that is a traditional way to do economic analysis, right? First of all, they impose a lot of assumptions, then do equal level analysis. Uh, that's pretty traditional way. And uh, some smart people argue that, okay, let's try a new way. Uh, and uh, we 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 really hate imposing a lot of unrealistic assumptions. And let's start with our analysis uh, from a very very simple point. Let's just impose a one instead of a series of just a one assumption. And this assumption is a powerful assumption. In most cases, is valid on this financial market. And this assumption is so called a non arbitrage assumption. Not arbitrage assumption. So, what is arbitrage? An arbitrage is a smart way for smart people to make risk free money on the financial markets. And it's based on the principle of uh, law of one price. So, what does one, law of one price mean? Well, I mean? The law of one price means, okay, let's say that, uh, there's identical. Uh, Product, let's say iPhone, iPhone 7, brand new iPhone 7, right? And uh, let's say you found iPhone 7 is selling for $800 at AT&T, but uh, uh, you found another place selling iPhone 7, the same item, at $600. As consumers, you will go for the cheaper one, but uh, as a smart investor, what you can do here is to do the arbitrage. Because you see there's a difference two hundred dollars and that two hundred dollars doesn't make sense. And the smart way is okay, you buy iPhone at six hundred dollars, you can buy as, as many as possible and sell it in another place at eight at eight hundred dollars. So you can make that two hundred dollars profit without taking any risk. And this is so called arbitrage. And arbitrage opportunity arises when uh, the law of one price principle is violated. So on the financial market, for the same security, it should be priced as the same, no matter which market it is traded on. Right? So that is a principle of uh, not arbitrage. I mean, I mean, you say, I mean, okay, if if a uh, law of one price is violated, then there will be arbitrage opportunity. And how can you say that the non arbitrage principle? Well, not arbitrage is a, a very strong assumption on the financial market. You see, when law of one price principle is violated, people buy low, sell high to make risk-free profit, right? And uh, I mean, not just one or two people is gonna take uh, that great opportunity. Any smart people, when they see arbitrage opportunity, they will go for it. So when more and more people uh, practicing so called arbitrage. The consequence is that, okay, uh, more people will uh, buy a product at a uh, low price. And more people will sell that same product uh, when prices are high. So over time, you will see the balance of supply and the demand on the markets. Right? And uh, when more people are buying iPhone at one place, the iPhone price will go up. And when more people are selling iPhone in another place, the iPhone price will decline until those two prices equal to each other. So this uh, non-arbitrage is a very strong argument. It assumes that, okay, if there's arbitrage opportunities, then a lot of smart investors will go for uh, arbitrage, arbitrage transactions. And uh, the competition among those arbitrageurs will lead to uh, lead it to the same price for iPhone in different markets.
and uh, that is a non-arbitrage principle and non-arbitrage principle is the most powerful assumptions that we can utilize in analyzing a lot of financial problems and uh, in the in the risk return trade-off analysis area we can use the same principle and actually the arbitrage pricing theory is simply based on this uh, powerful very simple assumption not arbitrage right? uh, the law of one price must hold if not there will be arbitrage and uh, competition among arbitrageurs will push will push price to the equilibrium level right? so so this arbitrage pricing theory goes on the different paths Right, and start with a very, very simple principle of non-arbitrage uh, non argument. Then the analysis, uh, then the analysis uh, following this non-arbitrage principle uh, actually is very different from the traditional equilibrium analysis. Right. And the arbitrage pricing theory uh, is a starting point for those multiple factor models that we utilized in our uh, in our modern uh, empirical research and uh, APT model, I mean this arbitrary mo pricing model is is much more powerful than the traditional CAPM model in explaining what's going on on today's financial markets. Let me show you one simple example on how this arbitrage work on how uh, this arbitrage work right? and uh, actually uh, this CAPM model can be viewed as a special case, special case under the arbitrage arbitrage pricing model. Right? Okay, let's say, uh, le I mean, let's forget about the theoretical derivation. Let's simply uh, think about uh, investing investing on financial market from investors' perspective. Right? Let's say investors are holding a portfolio, right? and uh, this portfolio have. Uh, several securities and it's a well diversified portfolio for a well diversified portfolio what can you say what can you say well for well diversified portfolio first of all the fund specific risk should be diversified away right? and in terms of market uh, regression I mean single index market regression that uh, error terms E E P E P here is the error term right uh, should be equal to zero and also uh, the intercept alpha here should equal to zero if if uh, the market is on the equilibrium level so a well diversified portfolio should earn uh, the return based on its beta right? and uh, alpha should be equal to zero and the error return should be equal to zero or the sum of both should be equal to zero uh, that is uh, what the theory says. Now let's use the arbitrary mechanism to see how uh, how this could be the case. I mean, as I said, I mean the the uh, the statement here is okay for a diversified portfolio, the return I mean the return should be based on uh, market risk, right? And uh, the alpha should equal to zero. There's, there will be no access return because it's in equilibrium and uh, uh, the area return should be equal to zero because it's the well diversified uh, the uh, the fund, fund space risk should be equal to zero uh, that is the statement but uh, you may ask why why that must be the case right why that must be the case you can argue that okay even for well diversified portfolio the fund specific, fund specific risk can still be positive or you can say for this well diversified portfolio alpha could be either positive or negative you can say that as the counter argument but uh, let's use the non-arbitrage principle to prove that okay uh, this alpha and uh, and this error term must equal zero must equal zero when the market is in equal I said it must, not just uh, it could, it may, right? It must equal zero. Now, let's start our analysis. 
Okay, let's say investor invest in this uh, uh, portfolio, well diversified portfolio, and this portfolio uh, sh uh, return should be based on the beta BP times market return. And in addition to this, you know that okay, if market is not on equilibrium, this alpha could be positive or negative, as well as uh, the arrow term here you might observe. Uh, for individual companies, uh, EP is the error term represents unsystematic risk, and this alpha P is the axis return, right? And our argument is that okay, this alpha and E should be equal to zero if the market is in equilibrium, right? But uh, the argument has to be proved. So here is our uh, here's our process to prove it. Now. Uh, uh, in addition to this well diversified portfolio, let's say we add another position, right? By investing the market index or the benchmark, or the benchmark. And how much should we invest in this benchmark? Well, the weight uh, should be equal to negative beta, negative beta of the P, which means we take a short position, a short position on the market index and the weight actually equal to the beta of our portfolio so that's uh, uh, a combination a long position for portfolio a short position on the market index right and when you take long short position you know that something's gonna be uh, canceled off and actually what, what will be canceled off is the market risk the market risk of your portfolio actually is neutralized by taking a short position on the market index. In addition to this, in addition to this, we also need to build another position in risk-free asset. Let's say T bills and weight equal to beta minus one. Beta minus one. So if beta is let's say one point one point two then that, uh, this weight on risk-free asset, it will, will be 0 0.2. But if beta is 0 0.6, then the weight for risk-free assets should be a negative number. So you either take a long or short position in T-bills, depending on the value of the beta. Now, let's come at all three positions together. Your portfolio, uh, your initial portfolio, your short position in the market index, and your long or short position in T bills. All right, so you have a, a portfolio, and we call this portfolio as an arbitrage portfolio. Right? Why is it called arbitrage portfolio? Because when you put everything together, you will recognize that uh, the weights for all three positions eventually lead to zero, which means uh, from investor's perspective, uh, the net cash flow equal to zero. I mean, look, uh, when you build a portfolio, you uh, spend money. But when you take short position on the market index, you are getting the proceed, right, by doing short selling. And also, if you short sell T-bills, you get a proceed. So cash inflows will offset with cash outflows. And uh, the weight, total weight equals zero means investor do not spend a penny. On this arbitrage portfolio, right? if you spend nothing on this portfolio, then what will be the consequence? Will you be able to make some money? If you are making some money, then this is a typical arbitrage opportunity. Right? And uh, on the third column of this table, you see that okay, if you come at everything together in terms of return, it equals alpha p plus e p. That is axis return and the arrow turn. So if a lot of people are doing arbitrage, then if you invest uh, nothing at the very beginning, then you shouldn't earn anything, right? So this alpha P and EP should be equal to zero, should be equal to zero based on non-arbitrage uh, non arbitrage argument. If RP is positive, let's say EP is, is equal to zero, then a lot of people are gonna take advantage by investing this portfolio P. But uh, when more people invest in portfolio P, then the prices will increase, which will drive down your future returns. 
and eventually this other p will converge to zero as well. So this non-arbitrage, non-arbitrage argument shows that if you invest in uh, invest nothing to this uh, three assets portfolio, you're supposed to earn nothing, which means your total return alpha p plus e p should equal to zero. And for diversified portfolio, this e p should equal to zero, and alpha p also need to be equal to zero. So this actually proves our initial statement that for a diversified portfolio, stock return should be uh, simply based on its, its, its market risk, or the risk can be captured by the beta. And also through this example, you see how arbitrage works, right? And uh, arbitrage, uh, to do an arbitrage, you have to take, um, you, you, you take opposite, opposite uh, positions on the same risk exposure. When you build a portfolio P, you are bearing market risk, right? And uh, to offset this market risk, you can take a shorter position on the market index. And also, portfolio P uh, carries risk-free rate of return, and uh, to neutralize this, this part, you can simply take a shorter position, or the opposite, opposite position on risk-free asset. Right, so arbitrage involves long and short positions simultaneously. You have to do it simultaneously on the same risk exposure. Right? And uh, in a, an arbitrage portfolio eventually will lead to uh, zero return if you invest in nothing. But if you invest in something for arbitrage portfolio, then your return should equal to risk-free rate of return. And we are going to we'll, we'll go, we'll use the same non-arbitrage argument for option pricing model uh, for the for the later chapters but uh, you should know this arbitrage non-arbitrage argument is a very very powerful tool that uh, uh, financial researchers are using uh, especially for derivative pricing and here's the application of arbitrage theory in terms of exploring risk return trade-off on the financial market And here's another example. Uh, if we apply, let's say, two risk factors in the uh, in the risk re return trade-off analysis, R1 and R2, and here we can follow follow the same procedure uh, to construct an arbitrage portfolio. Arbitrage portfolio, and uh, uh, that's another application for arbitrage method in risk return analysis. Right, so that is uh, all you needed to know for CAPM model and arbitrage pricing theory. Uh, you might feel a little, uh, a little fatigued and uh, because we have, we have went through a lot of difficult stuff uh, for the last three chapters. Risk and return, diversification, and this uh, capital asset pricing model as well as arbitrage pricing model. The good news here is the worst time is behind us. That is the hardest part for this class due to its quantitative nature. Right? So the theory is basically over. I mean, remember our class name is Portfolio Theory and Management. And at the very beginning, I promise you that we're going to make this a very practical course. And of course, there are little theory, but we're going to handle that. We're going to deal with the theory. And right now, uh, once you understand all the materials covered in this section, I would say you are in great shape. You are in great shape uh, handling this uh, portfolio theory. And what will happen next for the next three modules are very, very practical things that you need to deal with. It's uh, very easy, a uh, lot of fun, and a very interesting stuff that you really want to know. Right? So before we... Uh, uh, open the next uh, next chapters, uh, which uh, would be much easier than you, than what you see here in the first module. Let's uh, spend some time practice some typical homework questions. Right, so here are typical questions that you will see in your first homework and the first exam associated with CAPM model and arbitrary pricing model. Number 42, number 42. 
From a French claim that after controlling for firm size and ratio of the firm's book value to market value, beta is uh, one highly significant in predicting future return. Two, relatively useless. Uh, uh, number three, a good predictor of firm specific risk. Right. So, which one is best? Uh, is it the highly significant? The answer is no. It's it's weak. It's a weak predictor of the stock return. It's not highly significant. Relatively useless. I mean, uh, firm size, book to market ratio. Those are two good predictors, but not a beta. Uh, can we say it's a good predictor? Of course, the number three statement is not true. And here it looks like the best one is two. Relatively useless. It's not completely useless because sometimes it works, but uh, during other time period it doesn't. So you can say it's relatively useless. So B is the best answer. Uh, number 43. Which of the following uh, assumptions of simple CAPM model? Right? You need to identify those assumptions. One, individual trades of investors do not affect stock price. That means no investors can monopolize stock price. That's uh, one critical assumption of capital model. Uh, two, all investors plan for one identical holding periods. Three, all investors analyze security in the same way and share the same economic view of the world. Well, I think uh, both two and the three are correct because we assume that investors are they are homogeneous in terms of their forecast of uh, expect rate return, standard deviation, and also CAPM model is uh, is not time series analysis, is cross-sectional analysis, assuming that everybody will hold security during a specific holding time period. Uh, last one, all investors have the same level of risk aversion. Well, and you say, okay, if investors are homogeneous, they what does that mean? I mean, it's homogeneous in expectation, but not on the level of risk aversion. And the capital model allows, allows different level of risk aversion for typical investors. So the best answer is one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three statements are correct. The answer would be here. Number 43. 44. 44. This is a very simple application of capital model. Uh, risk free rate six percent. Expected re uh, return market is eighteen percent. And what is the expected rate of ret uh, return start with a bit of one point three? So here you uh, you need to recall the CAPM model. CAPM model uh, uh, show you that okay, expected rate of return equals risk free rate plus beta times market premium. You need to be careful about this market premium here because market premium is different from market return. And here 18% is market return. Market premium is difference between market return and risk-free rate. Right. So here, uh, the expected rate of return for this stock equals 60% risk-free rate plus uh, beta 1.3 times market premium. Market premium here is difference between 18% uh, and 6%. Or 12 percent, right? So that will give you an answer of 21 percent. Also, D is best answer. Number 45 in the context of capital asset pricing model, the system, a system a systematic measure of risk is captured by what? Very simple, captured by beta. Captured by the beta. Uh, the unsystematic risk can be captured by the error terms, error terms, right? For the single market model, a uh, single index market model. Number 46, market portfolio has a bit of what? Negative uh, 1, 0, 0 0.51, and actually uh, the market portfolio is a portfolio that contains all securities. It's market average, right? and the market average earns a bit of 1 because beta is a relative measure of riskiness relative to the market average. So market average to itself, of course, beta equal to 1. Number 47, in a well-diversified portfolio, what risk is negligible? So here it's very simple, unsystematic risk, fund specific risk, unique risk, or non-diversifiable risk, or uh, diversifiable risk. 
So here is unsystematic risk. Unsystematic risk is something that is negligible. Uh, it's supposed to be equal to zero if it's a well diversified portfolio. Number 48. According to capital asset pricing model, a, sec uh, a security risk, uh, either positive or negative alpha, is considered to be overvalued or undervalued. Okay, so, a positive alpha means that the star lies above the security market line, and as, I said, uh, as we discussed, that kind of securities are not overvalued but undervalued. Any point below SML will carry negative alpha is considered to be considered to be overvalued right so uh, positive alpha means positive alpha means on the value and uh, and negative alpha means overvalued so only c is correct positive alpha considered to be undervalued on the value i mean i mean you have to invest in undervalued stock in order to generate positive alpha positive alpha is the access return. Number 49, according to the capital asset pricing model, a fairly priced security will plot above, below, or along the security market line. And uh, this is very simple, of course, on the equilibrium level. A fairly priced security means it is in equilibrium, right? and, uh, and it should lies on the security market line, so B is the best answer. Number 50, According to CAPM model, fairly priced securities have positive, negative, zero, or uh, what kind of alpha or betas. Okay. So here, fairly priced means that the securities, uh, the, the tr uh, risk return trade-off of a security lies on SML, SML line. Right? And alpha should be equal to zero. And the beta could be positive, I mean, it could be negative, but uh, alpha has to be zero if it's fairly priced the security. D for number 50. Number 51. According to the capital asset pricing model, in equilibrium, all securities return must lie on security market line or below the line. Or the slope of security market line must be less than market risk uh, premium or any security with a beta 1 must have access return of 0 and A, C, D are all incorrect statement. And only B is correct. All securities return must lie on the security market line. Number 52. We have security X. Uh, expect rate of return of 13% and beta 1.15. Risk free rate 5%. And the market expected rate of return 15%. It asks you uh, to, 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 to see if this security is overvalued or undervalued, overpriced, underpriced, or fairly priced. So here uh, we, have, we have beta, we have risk free rate, we have market return, so we can estimate required rate of return for this security based on the beta of 1.15 and a calculation show you that the expect I mean expect rate of return for this security is 16.5 percent but actually this security has uh, expect rate of return 13 percent which means this security has risk return trade off below SML line and the alpha is negative negative in this case, this security is overpriced. Of course, it's overpriced because alpha is negative. And underpriced means that alpha is positive. Right? So if alpha is negative, this security is overpriced. And we shouldn't buy that kind of security. Instead, we should short sell it. Number 53. The possibility of arbitrage arises when the, <laughs> uh, the law of one price uh, principle is violated. Right? So here you look at uh, the similar statement. Uh, B is the best. Mispricing among securities creates opportunities for risk-free profits. So B is the best answer. Number 
four you invest the six hundred dollars in security A with a bit of one point five four hundred in B with a bit of zero point nine and what is beta for the portfolio? And here you come on two assets with different beta, and uh, your portfolio beta should be equal to its weighted average, weighted average betas. So here you calculate weighted average. Right? So what's what's the weight for first one? The weight for first one is six hundred divided by uh, one thousand dollars. One thousand dollars total investment. Six hundred plus four hundred is one thousand dollar total investment. And actually you. Uh, put a 60% of money in security A and a 40% in security B. And here you do weighted average, weight of A times weight of A plus weight for B and time that with uh, beta of B. That give you 1.26 as weighted average beta of B portfolio. Number 55. Number 55. And here's another application of CAPM model, right? With the beta with free rate market return, you can calculate required rate of return. And the alpha equals uh, the, expect rate, uh, the, the difference between expected rate of return and required rate of return. So here, your expected rate of return 12%, right? And what is the required rate of return? Required rate of return equals risk free rate 5% plus beta, which is, which is 1.1 times market premium. Market premium here is the difference between market return and risk-free rate, and the difference that you, that you can you that you can you can you can get here is 0 0.037, which means alpha is equal to 3.7 percent, and this stock is undervalued, of course. Number 56. Number 56. Uh, risk free rate four uh, percent, market return eleven percent, beta zero point eight, offer rate of return twelve percent. So here it's a similar uh, problem. Uh, you simply need to look at if alpha is positive or negative, right? And uh, the required return can be calculated by using CAPM model. It's equal to zero point. Uh, 96 or 9.6 percent. So you're supposed to earn 9.6 percent on the security, but actually you can earn 12 percent. Of course, the alpha is positive, and the current stock price is on the value. So B is the best answer. Number 57. Which of the following variables do you form a French plan to do a better job explaining stock return than beta? Here is very simple. Uh, firm size to market ratio so C is the best answer number 58 the most significant conceptual difference between arbitrary pricing model uh, uh, pricing theory and a capital asset pricing model is that a cap uh, recognize only one systematic risk factor C number 59 you run regression uh, here is a single market index regression and uh, you get two coefficients on the intercept and the slope. And uh, uh, here you wanted to yeah, read this table to interpret the information that you get from this table. And essentially, you wanted to uh, know what is the beta of this stock. There are six numbers. Which one is the beta? Right? And the beta is actually the coefficient on the slope, 0 0.89. And the intercept is 0 0.789. Okay, so based on the data, you know that the star earn, uh, A earned positive alpha that is statistically significant different from zero. Can you see that? Can you see that? Well, the, the alpha is equal to this intercept 0 0.789, that is positive, right? And this is statistically significant different from zero, where you look at uh, the range of this coefficient, right? It range from negative 1.556 to 3.457. So it could be zero, it could be negative, it could be positive. And actually, this estimate is not sig uh, statistically significant. So A is not true. B has a beta precisely equal to 0 0.89. And this is just the estimate of beta. And actually, beta ranges from 0 0.65 to 1.46 based on 95% of confidence level. So it could be 
lower or higher and you just cannot say it's precisely equal to 0 0.89 C has a bit of the likely to be anything between 0 0.65 and 1.46 that is true that is true likely to be anything between those those two numbers lower and upper 95 percent D has no systematic risk that is not true it has no systematic risk means beta has to equal to zero right and actually it's not so C is the best answer. Number 60. The risk premium for exposure to aluminum commodity price of 4%. The firm has a beta relative to aluminum commodity price of 0 0.6. Risk premium exposure to for exposure to GDP change is 6%. And the beta relative to GDP is 1.2. Risk we were 4%. So here uh, we are practicing a typical two-factor, two-factor model. Uh, one factor is uh, commodity price, the other one is GDP changes. Uh, you have two factors. Right? And uh, we use two-factor model to estimate return of this stock. So, uh, F first thing that you need to look at is uh, first factor, that is uh, a uh, risk exposure, risk exposure to commodity, which is the four percent here. The second is changes in GDP, which is uh, uh, zero point six, and then you times those two factor with uh, the coefficient one point two for GDP change and uh, six six percent for um, I'm sorry zero point six for the aluminum commodity price change. 0.6. So this is like a beta 1, this is beta 2. And here's two factors. And the plus the intercept, risk free rate of 4%. They will give you 13.6% of total return. So this is the application of two factor, two factor models. Number 61. Research has identified two systematic factors that affect US stock returns. The factors are growth in the industrial industrial production and the changes in long term interest rates. Industrial production growth expect to be three percent. Long term interest rates are expect to increase by one percent. You are analyzing a study that has beta one point two on in industrial production factor, zero point five on the interest rate factor. So here you have uh, another two factor model. Right? It contains interest rate and industrial production as to uh, two risk uh, two return factors and you also have coefficient on those two factors and uh, where's the bit uh, do you have do you have risk free rate of return no but uh, you can actually circumvent it so how so you continue read uh, it currently has an expected rate of return of 12%. However, if industrial production actually grow 5% and interest rate drop 2%, what is your best guess for your stock return? So I think the best uh, solution here is to start with uh, the current return. The current return is based on uh, the previous estimation of industrial production changes as well as interest rate changes. Right? But uh, here, uh, the real scenario has been changed. Previously, industrial production change would be 3%, but right now it's 5%. Right? So on this factor, you have 2% actual. And uh, another factor, interest rate change. Interest rate change. Initially, it's 1% increase, but here, uh, the new situation is to decline by 2%. So the difference is negative 2% minus 1% or negative 3% uh, net change. And here time this net change with its coefficient of 0 0.5. So, uh, so uh, the, the expect rate of return based on the new scenario would be 12.9%. Right? So that concludes our homework practice for the last chapter. So as I said, the hardest part is behind us. I want you to uh, review the material, read the textbook, practice homework questions, then move on to take the first exam. First exam. Any questions, comments, please post on D2L. Otherwise, I will see you in the next module. Thank you so very much.